Welcome back to All the Sins of Wisconsin. I'm Fallon and I'm here with Mims. How are you today? I am doing great. I feel like I'm doing a thousand things, but I'm crushing it. So I'm just going to keep the ball <laughs> rolling. <laughs> I feel like you're always doing a thousand things. You have so many different adventures in your life. I know. And that's why vacations are so important because they remind you that <laughs> life isn't work so i just came back from vacation and i threw that out the window apparently and i'm just like work 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 so work 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 yeah <laughs> as non-stop since you got stated. back huh you've been working almost non-stop since you got back seriously but i have been working out a lot and that's been a really great release for me so I think I'm doing okay. I think I can tone yeah. it back a little bit, but I think I'm doing okay. How are you doing? Good. Oh, we had fun for our little adventure on Saturday. Yeah, let's talk about that. Um, we, as close as we are, we don't see each other a lot because we both have a lot going on. Mm -hmm. um, but we took the day and had a date and I loved it. We went thrifting and we went to a new bookstore that opened up and I had a field day there. Loved it. Yeah. And we met some new people there. Because we right. friends everywhere we go. <laughs> Seriously. Yeah. Like we turned a corner and we're like, hey. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that was really cool. Much needed. Um, yeah. But yeah, that was a really great day. Yeah. Fun times. Do you have anything you want to start off with? Yeah, I just have a couple little news things um, that we'll probably end up getting more into later, depending on what comes out of it. So the first one, there was a human femur found at Bradford Beach in Milwaukee yesterday, March on March 6th in the morning. Jeez. And so they started an investigation and now they have found additional bones but those haven't been confirmed conclusively to be human yet. They're saying they could possibly be animal bones, but it looks like they found human remains. They at least yeah. found one human bone, so I would assume there's going to be other human bones. Right, right. So I'm going to keep an eye on that and see what comes from that. Maybe okay. that'll solve a missing person's case. Oh my gosh, yeah. That would be amazing, but also... Right. It is sad. Um, yeah, it's really sad. And then um, this is a sad update. So uh, UWSP students from a uh, junior from Stevens Point, he was found dead in the Wisconsin River. He went out with his friends on Friday night and had gotten lost from the group at some point in time he was reported missing saturday afternoon they started the search right away they got drones out and everything and they did end up locating him in the wisconsin river that is just oh god i hate that yeah it seems like there's been like an increase in people being found in the river again i don't know if you're familiar with the smiley face killer yeah, yeah. it's and they this is like the fourth one that I've heard about in the last like six weeks. So I, I don't know if that's related, but yeah, I don't. And they never figured that out, did they? The smiley face killers or killer killers? No. Um, it's still just like a theory that people in the true crime community and specifically, I can't remember the guy's name who came up with it specifically, but I'm really into that. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. I'm gonna look more into the ones that have happened because there was one in Lacrosse just a week or two ago too. Yeah. Why is it in Lacrosse? Because I remember hearing about the smiley face theory, and a lot of it seemed to be taking place in Lacrosse and in that area, just around. Yeah. Like it's, it's always by colleges and rivers. Right. Yeah. It's all through the Midwest. Um, there has been a lot in lacrosse though. Yeah. And then Chicago, Ohio. Yeah, I was thinking Ohio yeah. for sure. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's definitely some stuff going on in Ohio too, so it's very interesting. And it's always men, young college men. Yeah, super weird. Yeah. Okay. I mean, it's possible that they all just fall in the river, but it seems like with the large number of them in the circumstances surrounding disappearances, then it seems like there's something else going on. Yeah, it just seems like way too many to be a, a, a one-off thing. Yeah. Um, and especially like the type, it's, it's mostly men and at universities. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I don't, I think they are interconnected, but it's hard yeah. when nothing is concrete. It's just all up right. in the air. Right. What do you have um, for us today? I have something kind of lighthearted, but not at the same time. A person that works at the Milwaukee Athletic Club uh, basically didn't want to go to work and called in a bomb threat. And <laughs> they like evacuated the facility and obviously they investigated it and yeah, nothing was found. And then they figured out who it was and they're like, yeah, that person works here and didn't show up to work. So I actually looked through a couple of articles and they don't name the person, but there is a picture of the person. So I don't know. That's I, interesting. <laughs> yeah, I was like, so we're not saying the name, but you plaster his picture out there. Like, how does that make sense? Yeah, that's crazy. You could just yeah. call in sick. Like... <laughs> Or don't show up like a lot of people. Yeah, or just don't um, go. But like a, a full blown bomb threat. That's that's interesting. If we have any It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia fans in here, I'm a diehard fan and one of their episodes um they basically are trying to rush to go to see a movie and they all get there except one member of the the group and he got arrested and um he didn't want the rest of the group to enjoy the movie so he called in a bomb threat so that just reminds <laughs> me of that <laughs> that's great yeah he's like nobody's going if i can't go and he's like in the police station and he's whispering on because obviously right yeah the police station the calling in a bomb threat yeah and he's like i would like to report a, a bomb threat <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Um, it's great. Some not funny news now. So the Maryland mayor, Patrick Wojohn. Uh, was recently arrested on 56 counts of child porn after the Prince George's County Police Department received a tip from the National Center of Missing and Exploited Children. He is currently being jailed without bond and I'm sure we're gonna update everybody with how that all goes and what they discover, even though this is the worst thing that you can possibly um, be affiliated with as far as charges, anything kid related, I could just put my foot through their bro to the back and smash them with great mm -hmm. fierceness. I don't know where I was going with that, but I'm just angry. <laughs> it's just so many men in power abusing their position. Yeah, and like we've talked about before, like leave these kids alone. There's so many kids that have, or there's so many adults that have really horrific childhood experiences and i'm like it's too much it's way too much and you know what it's those those adults that abuse these kids unfortunately they've learned it from somewhere and a lot of the times they themselves have been the victims when they were a child and it's just like a really yeah. awful cycle that people keep pushing on and it's I hate it I hate it so much yeah. get help like if you've experienced trauma get help if you are having thoughts that are inappropriate get help yeah yeah just leave leave kids alone leave mm -hmm. animals alone if I hear one more thing about animals being abused I will scream 
Um, I don't play when it comes to animals. I won't even watch movies where an, or like a dog dies. Like I am legend. No, thank you. I don't want any part of that. <laughs> <laughs> I know, not for me. Fujo, never watched it, never will. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, but that's it for me. All right. Okay, let's get started then. Today I am telling the story of the Karnak family. And hmm. my sources are the charlieproject.org, uh, Wisconsin Circuit Court Access, and wimissing.org. So I'll start with a description of the Karnak family. Donna is the mother. She's married to Alan. And they had two adult sons, one named Thomas and one named Andrew. However, Andrew has changed his name legally, so his new name is Derek Nicholas Anderson. And the family resided in Helenville, Wisconsin in 1988, 1998, when this story takes place. So on July 2nd, 1998, the family was going to leave from Helenville and they were going to head north to their cabin in Coloma, Wisconsin for the 4th of July weekend. So they packed up everybody and their dog, like we're going to go have a good time a week away like a lot of us do for 4th of July. But for some reason they didn't return from their trip. A whole family. A whole family. Well. Wow. One son was still at home. Derek, the one that changed his name. He was still at home. So after the week went past and his family didn't return home, Derek contacted the police and let him know, like, my family went on this trip. They haven't been home. I don't know what's going on. We need to look for them. Like, my whole family is missing. Right. Which, how it's crazy for a family and even the dog to be missing. Yeah. How does that even happen? Very good question. So on July 10th, the family's black Chevy truck was found near Reedsburg in Sauk County, Wisconsin. And the vehicle appeared to have been wiped clean of any fingerprints. And there was no luggage present, so whatever the family had packed up was no longer in the vehicle. There was no sign of the Carnax and there was no sign of the dog. And oh, for years, don't, there would... Don't do I this know. to me. Don't do this to me. You just said that. Now I'm going to ruin your day. Oh, God. Okay. Well, maybe the dog got away. <laughs> yeah, let's, let's keep our minds there. Yeah. So for years, there would be no trace of anyone in the family. Besides Derek, the one that was at home reporting them missing. Right. Then in 2001... Um, skeletal remains were matched to the father, Alan. These remains had actually been found in 1999 in the Roy Taylor Forest in North Carolina. Wow. Mm hmm So they had found somebody was hiking. It was on a hiking trail. They found remains off the trail and they went into the database until they were matched with his DNA eventually in 2001. And near his body when he was found were the remains of a dog. <laughs> but they don't say it's their dog. Could just be a... Samara said it could be a coyote. <laughs> I I think it's their dog and I just, <laughs> it's just so crazy that I was just going on a rant about dogs. That's so wild. Right. And they also found a woman's t-shirt, a pair of men's briefs, and Donna's wedding ring. Oh no. But despite extensive searches, there was no sign of Donna or Thomas. And there was nothing, there was no way to prove that it was their dog either, because I'm sure they didn't have like dog DNA on file. Right. Do they do that? You can get a DNA test for your dog to see, like, what kind of dog it is. Then you would have their DNA. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, that would be crazy if, like, 
Oh, how cute would that be if, like, the police have, like, a little record of the yeah. dogs? I don't know. I think that's so cute. The dog <laughs> DNA database, they should. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I would love that. <laughs> and as the investigation continued, they... Oh, wait. I missed the part. Alan was found to have died from blunt force trauma to his head. Right. And... As the investigation continued, they revealed that on the day of Alan's disappearance, he had been at work prior to leaving for his trip, and he had received a phone call which led to him being very distressed, and he ended up having to leave work early, and before he left, he mentioned that he was having a family emergency and said something along the lines of he may have to go to a funeral. Wow, that is just all over the place. Mm Mm-hmm. So initially, the son, Derek, denied that he is the one that placed the call to his father, but uh, records showed that it was him and he eventually would admit that he did make the phone call to his dad, but he never specified exactly what it is that he said that had his dad upset or talking about funerals. Yeah, what? Yeah, it's a crazy story. Yeah. So at the time, Derek was living with his parents. He was a student at the University of Wisconsin-Whitewater. He was unemployed, and he had tens of thousands of dollars in student loans. Yep. And Alan's co-workers would go on to testify later that Alan and Derek had a very troubled relationship. So dad and son? Mm-hmm. Okay. And that at one point in time, the dad, Alan, had claimed that his son had attacked him with a club. That is so he, bad. He said, he, yeah, he had said he was scared of his son. He had came home and he had attacked him. And he believed that he was trying to kill him. Why was he still at home and nothing was done about it at that point? I don't really understand. And then it gets more interesting because we find out that Derek had regularly frequented the Roy Taylor Forest in North Carolina because he had been a student at the Western Carolina University from 1991 to 1996 where he had taken some kind of course where they went hiking through these woods and he decided that he liked it there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So when you said that about North Carolina before, uh, my mind immediately went to, what is their link there? And, Mm -hmm. okay, all right. Yep, now we know. What a bastard. Okay, if this is where I'm thinking it's going, what a bastard. Right. So while the search for the family was taking place, Derek had gotten himself into some trouble. In July of 1999, he had pled guilty to federal loan fraud and spent time in federal prison because he had lied on his application for a student loan. Ooh. I don't know what kind of lie you have to tell to go to prison for that. I was like, yeah. that's crazy. But that is super cr- I've never heard of that. No, me either. I was like, I, don't, I wonder what this lie was. Yeah. Yeah, don't, don't be lying to the government on taxes and stuff like that. They'll get you. Yeah. Definitely pay your taxes and don't lie about your student loans. Yeah. So in February 2001, he was released from prison and then he was charged with first degree intentional homicide in connection with his father's death. Wow. Originally, he was charged in North Carolina. But they determined that there was no evidence to indicate that Alan had actually been killed in North Carolina. Oh. So they dropped the charges there, and then Wisconsin was like, well, then we're going to charge him here, because it either happened here or there. So I guess it happened here. Good, okay. Mm Mm-hmm. So in 2006, Anderson pleaded not guilty to his father's murder. And his lawyers would argue that there's no evidence connecting him to the crime or to the disappearances of the rest of his family. But the prosecution countered that Anderson murdered his family for financial gain. They had an estate estimated to be valued between $550,000 to $600,000. 
And that was enough for the jury because in April of 2006, he was found guilty of his father's murder and he was convicted and sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. And he's never said where his mom and his brother were. Right. They are still just considered missing persons because there's been no bodies found and he will not admit to any involvement in this case. Authorities believe that they were murdered by Derek and that their bodies could be anywhere between Wisconsin and North Carolina. Because they said the mileage on the truck, he drove the family's truck to North Carolina disposed of his dad, drove the truck back, and disposed of the truck. So all of their belongings and everything are somewhere between here and there. That's a long drive. Yeah, I don't even know how long that would be as a drive. Like, what, 20 hours? Yeah, probably at least like 15, 17, something like that. Yeah, it's a long drive. And And if he did kill them here, he drove... 15 to how many hours, you know, stopping for gas, stopping to eat with his fucking dad and most likely his mom, his whole family, and the dog, man, in the car with him. How disturbed do you have to be to do that? Yeah. And he did try to appeal his case. And his basis for appeal was that he shouldn't have been charged in Wisconsin because they cannot prove that his father was murdered in Wisconsin. That is so bold. It's like, well, you can't prove it was done here, so you guys don't have any legal rights. But you're not saying you didn't do it. That's not what I'm hearing. No, I didn't hear that either. That's what I was reading this to my daughter last night. (laughs) And she was like, he never said he didn't do it. Yeah. (laughs) That's not what you want to say. No. Yeah. Well, he lost his appeal. He'll be in prison forever. Hopefully sometime, if he actually did this, which the jury thinks he did, he will admit what he did with his mom and his brother. You kill your entire family? And the dog? The dog. What what did the dog dog have to do with anything? The dog wouldn't have known anything. What is wrong with you? to drop the dog off anywhere yeah yeah that's awful that is an awful thing to do all around all of it like this is insane yeah wow and i've never heard of this i know i hadn't either all right so that's the story of the karnak family well great job thank you for bringing that to our attention i like i said never heard of it um crazy crazy all around yeah thank you so what for us today this case that i'm covering is dedicated to all my friends and family that listen uh, in an effort to support our pra- our passion project that doesn't like hearing about all this nitty-gritty <laughs> horrific true crime cases They bear with me every single episode. So I'm gonna give you a break and I'm going to talk about a much lighter story today. Um, So this is for you guys. Thank you for supporting us. Um, Even though I know this isn't for everybody. Right. I got my sources from NBC News, CNN, Uh, The Badgered Herald, 96.7 The Eagle, and The Washington Post. So, on March 27, 2015, a 20-year-old sophomore at the University of of Madison, Wisconsin, Audrey Ruth, I want to say Sealer, disappeared from her off-campus apartment without her coat or her purse. Um, So this is March, so this is around this time of year. You still kind of need a coat. It's still Mm kind of cold out, depending on the day, apparently, because Wisconsin can't make up its mind. I I was just talking about this with somebody else today, that yesterday was like 
snowing like crazy and today I'm like, it's beautiful out. <laughs> right. Um, so she was reported missing when she failed to show up at a gathering later that day. Friends and family from her hometown of Rockford, uh, Minnesota, flooded into Madison, searching the woods area and neighborhoods around the Madison area where she um, lived off campus. However, she was not found during the search. Until four days later, she was discovered curled in a fetal position in a marsh near the State Department of Revenue building um, by a co-worker that was, um, not a co-worker, sorry, a worker um, that saw her in that march or marsh uh, during their lunch hour. They were just out on a stroll. They looked over, seen this woman curled up and immediately called the police. Hmm. She was so, <clears throat> Audrey was rushed by ambulance to St. Mary's Hospital where she was treated and released that same day. She told the police that she was abducted at knife point and she elaborated by stating that the bad man abducted her from her apartment and took her to the marsh where he tied her, bound her, and forced her to take cold tablets. She... <laughs> your face um, like cold cold tablets that's a new one that's very like, new yeah like nyquil it just said cold tablets so i don't know i'm thinking okay. like tylenol for some reason but <laughs> yeah um she described the abductor as a white male in his late 20s or early 30s about five foot eleven or six feet um, who was last seen wearing a black sweatshirt, jeans, and a black knit cap. Investigators started to look into the case to figure out who this abductor was, what was the motive for this, and how to catch him before he would strike again. Because, I mean, that's super weird. Why would he randomly take her to a marsh? tie her up, give her cold medicine, and then leave her <laughs> almost unharmed, you know? That doesn't make any sense, so they want to figure it out. It's very strange. In addition, police interviewed a man who said he had seen the woman in the marsh on... Oh wait, I skipped a part. I am sorry. Okay, so investigators started to look into the case to figure out who this abductor was. Um, police combed through the brush with weapons drawn, but found only the knife, duct tape, and other items in the marsh. In addition, police interviewed a man who said he had seen the woman in the marsh on the days that she was being sought. So when they were looking for her, that's when he saw her, and that she appeared to be alone and unthreatened. So this was strange to investigators, so they did some digging. They looked into a surveillance camera at Audrey's apartment building that showed her walking out alone at 2.30 a.m. that Saturday. But then after reviewing different surveillance footage, they noticed something strange. So Assistant Police Chief Noble Ray stated that the footage showed Audrey buying a knife, duct tape, rope, gum, and cold medicine before she vanished. So she want to make sure she didn't get a cold while she was around? <laughs> I don't get it. I don't get it at all, but I mean, we're going to we're going to go through this. Okay. So this obviously raised red flags for investigators. They're like, "Well, that's everything that she was found with. She described as the cold medicine herself." So this is just really strange. So now they're looking more closely at Audrey. And Chief yeah. Ray said that a search of her computer turned up maps of wooded areas in the Madison and extended weather forecasts, suggesting she planned the whole thing just hmm. based off of like what the weather would be like on certain days and like what areas would be best for a pretend kidnapping. Um, 
They went back to question Audrey more on what had happened, and when doing so, a new version of the story came up. Um, she said she was abducted, not at her apartment, but elsewhere in Madison, but didn't say where. Hmm. Adding to the mystery was a separate story Audrey reported to being attacked from behind by an unknown assailant in a separate incident in February, the month before she was abducted. Oh, she's so she really just like, that. yeah, just all these things are coming to light all of a sudden. So investigators, the majority of them are not dim-witted. They are there to do a job, and if they actually take pride in their job, they will sniff out the truth. And that's exactly what happened in this case. Uh, police figured out that this college sophomore, Audrey, lied about being held captive and made up the entire story. Police spokesman Larry Campbell stated, we don't think an abduction occurred at all. Chief Ray stated, he couldn't speculate on what motivated Audrey to concoct the story, except for her statement when she altered her story Friday that she originally left her apartment because she wanted to be alone. Hmm. He then uh, declined to comment on whether she could face charges for lying to the police, saying investigators it will still saying that the investigation is still open so they didn't want to you know say anything would happen right um the police announcement uh made an announcement came as a shock to those who uh, knew audrey many of whom described her as a good student who was captain of her high, sc high school basketball and volleyball teams it just seemed so out of character of her to do um and what could possibly possess her to do such a thing people don't just fake an abduction or you know anything like that for no reason right audrey's Very strange thing to do yeah it is and you know i've heard of people like pretending people like or pretending that they've gotten hurt um like hitting themselves and then saying like oh i like i got punched by whatever but like I don't know, yeah. this is a whole elaborate scheme. Yeah, with a lot of planning, it sounds like. Right. So Audrey's boyfriend's brother, David Fisher, openly stated, quote, our whole family is not doing well at this point, but we love her. Whatever happens, we'll love her through whatever, end quote. So they remain supportive of her. And in Minnesota, Principal Roman Perscola, of Rockford High School said he hoped people would not condemn Audrey as she works to regain control of her life. Um, the principal also stated, we, like everyone else, are struggling to understand and deal with the news. We do not know what's going on in Audrey's life, mind, or heart. We only know that Audrey still needs our concern, end quote. People were still in her corner, like I mentioned before. Um, after she wasted the police's time and, you know, taxpayers' money, her father, Keith, stated that he felt badly about what police and everyone else went through, but was happy to have his daughter back. I mean, she didn't leave. That's... But I guess in his but mind... his felt mind, real to them. Yeah, it felt real to them, for sure. Um, Audrey's attorney, Randy Hopper, described her as a model student and a model citizen in her community with no criminal history or, or history of emotional problems. It was reported that Audrey was later admitted into a psychiatric facility, which frankly I believe was the best thing for her, just to better understand what was going through her mind, what her state of mind was, and she may not have had a history of mental illnesses or problems or emotional problems, but that doesn't mean that they don't come up over time in your life, so. Right. So, what happens when you fake an abduction? What are the ramifications? Well, the police estimated costs for the intensive manhunt would exceed $70,000, and that rough estimate was determined by the mayor, David's, uh, I'm not even going to try with the last name, the, the mayor's <laughs> office. Um, 
The Milwaukee Assistant City Attorney Rudolph Conrad said there's no provision in state law that allow a city to sue someone to recover the cost of police services, although a judge could order restitution of police costs as a part of a potential criminal sentence. So Audrey didn't escape punishment. She was sentenced to three years probation after pleading guilty to two misdemeanor counts of obstructing police. She was also ordered to reimburse the Madison Police Department $250 per month for the length of the probation. And that amount could increase to $400 a month if she graduates and gets a job. So that was just based on what she could afford. Okay. In the criminal complaint, complaint, Audrey blamed depression for what she, why she acted so irrationally. She stated, I set everything up. I'm just so messed up. I'm sorry, end quote. And I think she was speaking truthfully. She probably yeah. just wasn't all there at that point. Right. Her roommate verified that she was always crying and seemed very depressed. And while I understand that she did... What she did was irrational and quite honestly harmful to her friends and family and community that were really worried about her and the investigators who put a lot of time and energy investigating her case. People that are mentally stable don't do something like this. And yeah, I'm just glad that she did get mental help and that she did some get some sort of punishment just to, you know, lay a precedence so that, you know, people don't just make things up and without consequences too. Right, and probation to make sure that she like follows through with the counseling and stuff that she needs to do. Yeah, and I was a little bit discouraged when I read that the 96.7, the Eagle really tore into her by calling her stupid. And to me, it's a little bit unprofessional. However, I, I understand the frustration towards yeah. what she did but I think that's a little bit harsh in my opinion. Well it was like it was such I remember when it happened because I lived in Madison and it was like everybody was so frantic that yeah. a college student had gotten kidnapped or disappeared and then during that time they did find somebody else that had been missing they found their remains during the search so it did lead to solving another crime which was helpful but right People were very upset because it was, you know, the whole community and the police and everybody out looking for her. And yeah, it was I totally made up. get that. Yeah. I totally get that. I I understand that it, it there's mental health issues intertwined, but I also get that there was a huge waste of time, a huge waste of resources. Um, mm -hmm. and that people really got invested in her disappearance and, um, you know, that isn't something light. And if right. my friend or family member went missing and then I found out that, you know, after four or any days of me having to like put my mind that they are gone and something terrible has happened to them or could have happened to yeah. them, that's just a really heartbreaking place to be and to put yeah. your your loved ones in and I get it. I get why people yeah. are frustrated. <laughs> I hope she's doing better now. Yeah, I hope so too. I hope she's in a better place. I haven't seen any updates on where she's at or whatever. She's probably more private now. Um, yeah, I would imagine. So, yeah, that is my story. <laughs> Great job. Thank you. No um, gory details or... <laughs> Nope, nope, and I'm usually all about those in my uh, cases, so I'm giving everybody a break, including you, so. Good um, job. <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to be so kind next week, though, so. <laughs> oh, no, now I'm scared. <laughs> all right, we love you guys. All right, we love you. Bye. Bye.